can't despise Come to my zone. We all do, we all do, we will do. Let's get this fire out. So come to my zone. If it ain't us together, we'll get this fire out. Let's get this fire out. They came with popping bridge. Okay, we are about to start the May D Day for today, so please uh, prepare for having the D Day today with us. So please be seated and please check your cell phone if it's a vibration mode or silence mode.
Okay, we are about to start. So 2023 May D-Day will begin in a moment. Please be seated and please check yourself in again if it's in silence mode or vibration mode. I didn't expect that much quiet moment. Okay, welcome to May D-Day in here, everyone. My name is Naya. I'm a host of D-Day for today. So, and I was used to work with the D-Camp like it's eight years ago. <laughs> so it's been quite a long time, but it's really an honor to be here with the D-Camp and with the amazing entrepreneurs and investors in Singapore. So I really welcome all of you guys in here to be with all of us together because it's a really special day for D-Day because it's the D Day, uh, first D Day to be held in overseas for the D Camp in Singapore. So, we're gonna introduce the promising Korean five startups in here, which are getting ready or already starting to expand their business in Southeast Asia and especially in Singapore. So, we hope you have a wonderful time enjoying the global debut stage of a startup from Korea in various industries such as finance or FMB or healthcare. And one more information May D Day is also being live streamed on the official DCAMP YouTube channel. So, for online members, if you're watching the YouTube, please make the comment if you have any questions or wondering about the startups you're gonna meet or DCAMP or D Day. So DDA offers the benefits such as workspace, as you see, workspace, investment, and growth support what early stage startup needs, like mentoring, networking, and so on. So for this May DDA in particular, we are providing support for Asian market business expansion. This includes opportunities for DCAMP and front one workspace investment from the camp as well as tailored resources such as local partners, workspaces and investment for settling in Singapore. And also you're gonna have one more opportunity. You can get a, uh, you can get global or assess one month pre fast for, for WeWork. So you can go to the WeWork anywhere in the world for a month for free. So for the upcoming award ceremony, we are thrilled to announce two awards. Today, we have two awards. One is the Best Dream Award, and second is the IMDA Best New Entrance Award. So the Best Dream Award will be presented to one startup with the price of 10 million won. And for the IMDA Best New Entrance Award, the selected startup will not only receive the prize money, but not also be prioritized for consideration in the IMDA accelerating program. This program pro, uh, provided by our co-host IMDA will provide support for Singapore residency, market entry, and expert advice to help the startup accelerate their growth and success. So in addition, we are pleased to inform you that our D-Day supporter, D-Day Alliance, has 16 VCs or ACs will be conducting constant investment review, reviews for D-Day participating teams. This present a fantastic opportunity for startups. 
And now we have a, a D Camp has a lot of network in Korea market and also global market. And because we are expanding our network to the global, so if you have, uh, if you are with us for May D Day today, you are gonna get a lot of information from D Camp and the chance to get into the global market. Before we begin the main event of the D Day, I mean the pitching from the amazing five startups. We have a special guest. This D-Day is being held in partnership with IMDA. So IMDA supports various startup support programs for the growth and the innovation of Singapore's information and communication technology and media industry. So through collaboration with DCAMP, they also support the expansion of Korean startup. So please welcome Edwin Lo, director of IMDA, the co-host of the May D-Day. Hi, good afternoon. This is the best spot for the lights. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, today um, is a historic first. So, you know, DCAM has done hundreds of demo days, but this is the first one they actually do outside of Korea. So I think it's quite special for us to be part of this journey with them. Um, I also want to make special mention uh, for this partnership with DCAM. You know, with partners, this. It's, what, it's not what they say, but what they actually do. So I think DCAM has actually demonstrated uh, since once we signed the MOU one year ago, they have actually excelled in, in, in uh, many of the expectations that we had. Two of our, our companies have uh, better data and deconstruct have gone to Korea and they are thriving. So that's good. So they've actually welcomed our startups there. And to get to the, today, uh, they have worked with our team to go through over 80 over startups and today you see the best five. So that, you know, is a lot of effort behind the scenes and I want to commend our uh, DCAM team for doing that. Uh, to the judges, thank you for taking the time out. Uh, the ecosystem is always richer with your participation. Uh, to the companies, welcome to Singapore. I understand my colleagues are already in engaging with you to um, spoof your entry and your presence here and I'd like to wish you all the f success in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So actually, the five startups is going to get a really great chance with the IMDA for getting into the Singapore market, including Southeast Asia, I'm sure. And we have like um, maybe half Koreans and half Singaporean in here. So we are doing the D-Day in English, but some of you don't know what D-Day or D-Camp are doing in startup ecosystem. Actually, uh, yeah, actually I've, did, I've been talking about this a lot, but D-Camp is the largest and the kind of oldest. <laughs> yeah, because it has uh, more than 10 years of history in Korean startup ecosystem. So it has really a lot of experience to build up the startup in Korea and in abroad. So now let me introduce DCAMP and let me introduce the person who present the DCAMP. Our, <laughs> yeah, our CEO of Bank Foundation for Young Entrepreneurs, DCAMP, Young Da Kim. Please welcome him on the stage. Oh, hundreds of people here. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Singapore D-Day. Wow, this is an amazing stage. <laughs> you can see the you know fresh flowers. This is first time, you know, with the you know, fresh flower stages. <laughs> uh, uh, it's very nervous. <laughs> uh, first of all, first of all, I gave you you know thank, special thanks to you know, Edwin of you know, IMDA and also KB, you know, Finance Group. Wow. Uh, I have to, you know, explain about DCAM. Yeah, DCAM uh, stands for, you know, Dream Camp. Dream Camp. You don't, you know. Uh, it serves as a base camp to startups to help, you know. And also, uh, DCAM is a, has a, you know, official name. Official name is a uh, young uh, young. Uh, what is that? The Bank of Foundation uh, for Bank Young Entrepreneurs. Foundation for Young Entrepreneurs. 
I'm very nervous today. <laughs> uh, oh, DCAMP is a foundation established with uh, you know, the financing, uh, financing of uh, uh, $0.7 billion dollars from 19 major uh, financial institutions in Korea. Our mission is to support the growth of startups. And DCAMP offers uh, uh, networking opportunities, uh, incubation services, and also uh, invest investment support as it's a key component. The first network. For the last 11 years, uh, we have been hosting a monthly demo day called D-Day to provide a debut stage for startups to be introduced to investors and the public. And uh, we operate uh, the largest startup incubating center and also the oldest center with a rich history in Korea. We also uh, have uh, branches in local regions in Korea and, all, and overseas. We offer nurturing programs like uh, education sessions, uh, business consultations, mentoring with uh, experts in PR, HR, and community programs. Uh, half of the uh, Korean unicorn startups received direct and indirect or direct or indirect investment from DCAMP. We have directly invested in hundreds of startups and contribute to, from, uh, contribute to form about 50 firms currently. We have invested in five global firms since last year, many of them are Singapore-based firms. Next. Uh, we aim to provide foreign startups with the same level of support. Uh, next slide. <laughs> slide is no, no, no. Okay, that's one. Uh, we aim to provide foreign startups with the same level of uh, support that we provide to Korean startups. So, they can have business opportunities in Korean market. Previous one, okay. Just previous page. Hey, previous, okay. Uh, we also, Korean staff can expand their business uh, through you know, various business partnerships in overseas markets. I am thrilled to introduce five outstanding startups who are ready to enter the Singaporean market. We believe this chance will be a stepping stone towards their eventual, eventual, eventual expansion into Southeast Asia. Additionally, we look forward to collaborating with the Singaporean partners such as IMDA to promote global expansion of startups. Thank you and please enjoy the pitching of the five teams from Korea. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Honestly, if we do the D-Day in Korea, we don't usually, we, we are not usually nervous because it's a super casual and I don't even dress up like this much. <laughs> but Serum, <laughs> team leader of the global team of the D camp, asked me, what are you gonna wear tomorrow? So, okay, so that means I need to dress up a little, like, a formally. That's why I dress up, like, a little too much. So, <laughs> that was the reason I kept laughing at watching Young Da Kim, the CEO of Day Camp. So, like my dress up, today is that much a special day because it's, a, as I mentioned, it's first overseas demo day from the Day Camp in Singapore. So, you see, Young Da was nervous and I was I'm, I'm a little nervous so my, our entrepreneurs might be super nervous so before introducing the judges please be smiling <laughs> when you watch the audience or the entrepreneurs so it's time to introduce our amazing judges so young dog mentioned about our judges and partners IMDA already but 
from now on, I'm gonna introduce the judges one by one. So, I kindly ask the judges to give a brief greeting from your seat. First, we have Edwin Law, director from IMDA. Yeah, one more greeting as a judge. Thank you so much. And we also have Shiwon Kim, head of investment from DCAMP. And we have Muli Ravi, co-founder and partner from Team Man Capital. And we also have Sangu Han, partner from Sento Ventures. And please welcome Angela Toy, partner from Golden Gate Ventures. Thank you. And we also have Wembo Drunk, director from Open Space. And our final judge, Yang Eun Tan, investor from Insignia Venture Partners. Okay, now we have seven judges. So that means it's time. It's getting a time to meet the startup entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs, please be relaxed. Because we have a more time before we're gonna meet the pitch. So it's like a ice breaking, but we called it open mic. So I think you might know this company, Pink Phone. So Pink Phone is already a super global company, but from Korea. So this will be a great opportunity to share the experience for startups expanding your business into South Asia, South Asia, uh, East Asia market and more global markets. So please welcome Director Kwon Binna of Pink Pong about the company's global business expansion strategy and plans to enter new market. Hi, uh, I'm Binna Kwon, Chief Strategy Officer at Pink Pong Company. And I'm so nervous here. Yeah. Everyone because, nervous, don't yeah, worry. I have to speak in English. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me here today. And I'm so happy to be a part of the day. And I'm so honored to speak at Open Mic. I will give a short introduction of our company and then provide an overview of our overseas businesses with a focus on expansion into Singapore. The Pink Fun Company is a global family entertainment company aimed to bring joy to the world. One of our famous video, Baby Shark Dance, has reached remarkable status of number one most viewed video in the history of YouTube with over 10 million views and we still hold the record as of today. Our company creates high quality content for kids and family based on the catchy tunes like Baby Shark. We make our productions through many channels like TV and streaming platforms like YouTube and mobile applications. With strong brand awareness of our IPs, we expanded into diverse area like uh, merchandise sales and live shows and location-based experiences. Please meet our lovely IPs. We have four franchise IPs for preschool target, Ping Fong, Ping Fong Wonder Star and Bebe Finn and Baby Shark. And we recently expanding our target audience to teenagers and even adults. Uh, on the left side, you can see our content look is focused on comedy and healing for adults. On the right side, Moonshark is aimed toward the Gen Z and Gen Arpa. By expanding our target audience by releasing these new IPs, we are truly becoming family entertainment brand. Over the years, our company achieved a lot of success, but I'd like to highlight a few of our accomplishments. 
First, the ping pong company was named 100 most influential companies by time in last year. And second, our movie Ping Pong and Baby Shark Space Adventure ranked number five movie on the Netflix for outstanding movie and premiere content. Let me tell you more about the Ping Pong and Baby Sharks overseas business in Singapore. Oh, sorry. At first, the ping pong company started our business with mobile application. Since 2012, by 2014, our app ranked number one in education and kids categories in over 100 countries, including Singapore. So we realized that the Singapore was huge market opportunity with English and Chinese speaking population. And the revenue generated from Singapore was extremely high. Uh, we didn't even target Singapore specifically. So this led us target Singapore as a core market in the global business as we continually uh, creating English content for global fans. Then we started to understand the culture of Singapore. We realized that Singapore's lifestyle uh, is centered around, heavily, heavily centered around the shopping malls. So we started to try to uh, hold a more live shows around, around Clock K and in some other downtown areas. In 2020, as you know, COVID-19 broke out. So it, be, it became hard to hold more offline events. Instead, we collaborated so many global brands like Intercontinental Hotel and Baskin Robbins and Nestle. And we also cooperated with government organizations like Incheon Airport and Seoul City. Uh, let me tell you more about our partnerships in Singapore. We collaborated with Singapore Tourism Board to promote Singapore tourism industry together. And we released the music video called Sing Sing Singapore in nine different languages to introduce key attractions of Singapore, such as Gardens by the Bay. And we even developed limited edition travel merch, uh, such as echo bags and uh, passport covers. Another partnerships in Singapore we did was with Sea Aquarium to raise awareness about sharks and sea life <laughs> uh, and environmental preservation by releasing more branded content like this. We also collaborated with PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency to increase public awareness about water conservation for kids. And we recently have a partnerships with MediaCorp, so you can watch our ping pong contents on channel number five and me watch. Also, our immersive playground, Ping Pong World Adventure Tour, is having, is having place all around the Southeast Asia. In last year, we held an indoor theme park at Marina Square and we'll be back this year, this June, at Marina Bay Sands for live musical. And finally, I'd, I'd talk about some strategies for expanding our global market in the near future. When it comes to Southeast Asia, and uh, especially in Malaysia and Taiwan, 
we have planned to open more uh, pop-up store and music car event. With Brother, uh, our ping pong's Portuguese channels hit over 2.6 million subscribers. So we launched another YouTube channel in Bebefi IP. Uh, when it comes to Japan, uh, as you know, Amazon's presence is so huge in Japan. So we will approach Japanese market uh, through Amazon. And so many collaborations, uh, famous brands like Kids Cafe in Japan. As you can see, Ping Fong strives to keep growing and reach more global fans. Thank you for listening and best of luck when your pitches. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And if anyone have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Yeah, as you know, Pink Pong has already over a billion views on YouTube channel, and everyone knows Baby Sharks and Pink Pong and more characters from Pink Pong. So if you have any questions, how to get into another market out of Korea at the first step, or in Singapore, or any Middle East Asia market, please please feel free to ask. And more, we have a gift from Pink Pong. <laughs> Oh yeah, three sets. Can I see inside what's in there? <laughs> oh wow. Oh, he prepares a lot. Oh, cute. Like this? <laughs> and then Baby Shark plus toy. This is a co-production a co-produced show with Nickelodeon. Yeah, and then oh. <laughs> we have another Doll. Okay, so now we have a three sets, yeah, right? Hand, doll, <laughs> oh, ping pong. Yeah. Okay. Whoever asks questions can get these. Questions. Okay, so <laughs> if you ask the first question, we're gonna give you the choice. So you can choose whatever you want <laughs> because it's the first. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Where, where, where? Who? Oh, Who? over there? Can you see the lady behind of you? Okay, you can choose out of three <laughs> dolls. Okay. Then I would like to know, yeah. okay, if your contents are educational to the kids. And second question is, because a lot of kids spend a lot of time looking at the screen, so how are you going to you know, help them to control their screening. Wow. <laughs> uh, first question, uh, my answer is my, our content, ping pong content are educational and uh, with an entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> the a priority of our company is making content with entertainment, yeah, including education. And second, Um, yes, um, those kind of songs that we base on uh, are very addictive at some point. Uh, but we try to look at it as not just like uh, junk food, but since we try to make our food, make our content um, ed educational at the same time, uh, I think we cover uh, what children love. Like um, we help children learn healthy habits. We learn children. Uh, we we help children learn uh, the relationship with their friends and families. So those type of um, educational messages that we try to bring to the content. With, um, um, helps our uh, helps all the children and even parents uh, to uh, to provide the content without uh, worrying too much uh, of the screening time. Yeah, thank you. And actually, we also have the kind of startup to solve the digital addicted matters <laughs> in the world. Yeah, and when it comes to our mobile application, the parents can set the time for watching. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, so is there any dolls you want to get? <laughs> the hands one? Hands one? Yeah. This guy? Is that right? 
Oh yeah, that one. Okay, congratulations. You're gonna get pink pong dolls. <laughs> and is there more questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, we already target the global. Uh, uh, we our company started with mobile application, so we released app, and all over the world, uh, uh, global users can use our app. And same on the YouTube. So, yeah. Uh, so there's no change in content strategy. Yeah, up to the country, do you make the contents differently for the countries or just to uh, expose your same contents for globally? Uh, we do both ways. Basically, when we start building one content, we uh, try to aim for global market, obviously, based on English uh, language. And uh, we also do localization, where we try to understand different cultures and different backgrounds of each country to bring uh, those cultural backgrounds to our content. So we go both ways. So in terms of um, overseas, like global strategy, we try to collaborate uh, with um, global platforms like Nickelodeon so that we can reach a large audience all over the world. At the same time, we bring uh, the localized content, uh, we localize our content uh, and release it uh, through local platforms as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. What do you want to get from the pink pong? Like a baby shark or a yeah, pink pink pong? Shark. Baby shark. shark. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Now uh, we're going to close this session. And please, can you please give the doll to the director, please? Sure. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so thank you so much. Here was the Pinna <laughs> Guan. Yeah. I'm still holding baby sharks till the first team's picture, so <laughs> please understand this. And yes, we heard about the ping pong story, but it's gonna be your story from our five startups from Korea because they are starting to expand their business to the global market. So it's the time to meet how they are gonna do their business plan for the global market and especially in Singapore. So for your presentation, I mean for each startup, the startup has a 15 minutes, including five minutes presentation and 10 minutes Q&A session. If you spend a little bit more time than five minutes, that means you're gonna get less time for a Q&A session. So you can see the timer behind of the audience. So please control the time while you are doing the pitch. Okay, so judges, when you have a question during the Q&A session, you have the microphone in front of you. So please just pick up the microphone and Feel free to ask the question after the presentation. So our first team is the healthcare industry. So please welcome Hun Sang, Corporate Development Officer of Hure Positive Corporate, uh, revolutionizing the healthcare industry through cutting edge digital solution. Please welcome him as our first presenter. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Hoon Sung and I'm a Corporate Development Officer at Trade Positive. Before I start, I want to say thank you to DCAMP, IMDA, and KB Group. And also I have a two-year-old son and I have a lot of questions for a pink phone tonight. <laughs> okay, I will start our presentation. Uh, I will start with a very key figures of our Shred Positive. Uh, we are an uh, industry pioneer in digital health industry with over 13 years of experience. Last year, our revenue was 15 million US dollar. And we are now Series C stage company. And we have teams of more than 120 employees. And 70% of them are engineers. We are a very IT focused company. And we already successfully expanded our business operation to Japan and Vietnam. And we are number one digital health company in South Korea. 
Uh, this is what we have done until now in digital health industry in South Korea. Our main business area is to develop and sell of a digital health application. We have tons of experiences and expertise in this business. First, we have built a solid business model. In the B2B space, uh, we have uh, launched an industry-first diabetes application, and now we are supplying employee assistant program to large enterprises like Samsung Electronics. In the B2G space, we are closely working with Ministry of Health, and we are also participating in a program that gives reimbursement of using digital health apps. In the B2C space, we have a fever management application uh, for children, and it has more than uh, 300,000 monthly active users in Korea. And we have extensive experiences in developing uh, evidence-based application across multiple disease, disease areas such as uh, diabetes, obesity, and skin disease, and so on. And our app spans the entire life cycle of users. So, why Southeast Asia for free? First, we are targeting, we are aiming to become a number one digital health company in, South, in Asia, whole Asia. Second, Southeast Asia is definitely one of the most fastest region for a digital transformation. Third, it needs cost-effective healthcare service, and digital health can be a solution of that. And Huey Positive has a region-specific strategy on that. Vietnam. Vietnam is not young forever, and it is crucial to start preventive care and manage chronic disease. There is also a significant overcrowding at all large medical insti institutions in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. Therefore, it is necessary to divert demand to primary care. We have launched an uh, application for a chronic disease management, which name is Dr. Around, and plan to embed a telehealth service with that. It will be operated by a large hospitals, such as uh, Hanoi Medical University Hospital, and it will connect to a primary clinic located in rural area of Vietnam. We have a plan to expanding the service area into, into throughout whole Vietnam region. Indonesia. Geographically, Indonesia is always exposed by an uh, endemic disease such as Zika, malaria, and dengue. And also, it is the, one of the regions that are most affected by COVID-19. Do you know what is the common clinical symptom of that disease? It's the fever. We have a fever coach application uh, that can, uh, the fever coach guide users on how to manage your fever based on the temperature, medication, and other information. It can predict, alarm, epidemics, and also it can create a heat map. We have released this application across uh, 40 countries worldwide and plan to launch it to the Southeast Asia region as well. And we hope to collaborate with a telehealth company in this region. The finally, Singapore, the convergence of public and, and private, the convergence of public and private sectors has begun. However, IT system integration is still in an early stage. The convergence is because the Singapore government is prioritizing the preventive care and primary care by leveraging GPs. It is uh, evidenced by uh, initiatives such as uh, health healthier SG. Hure can offer a wide range of IT solutions which is developed and widely, widely used in South Korea and Japan to bridge the existing gap. We hope to extensive, uh, we, we have extensive experience managing chronic disease, more than uh, 43,000 patients who has a chronic disease. And how, and, and by using AI and human coach. We can provide these various digital health solutions to support GP, both GP and patients for uh, efficient and effective care. Thank you. This is, the, this is the end of our presentation and please give me any questions.
Okay, thank you so much. So now we're gonna have uh, we're gonna move on to the Q and A session. So we have yeah nine minutes. So judges, please feel free to ask. Yes. Hello. Please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think you've done really well, so congrats on all your progress. Uh, you've mentioned three countries, Vietnam, yeah. Indonesia, and Singapore. And each country, like you said, is quite different. How do you assess when you go into a new country whether you should progress further or you should take a pause? What indicator do you look for to decide, am I doing well, am I not doing well? Uh, it's very complicated. Complicated uh, question. Not only in Southeast Asia, healthcare industry is very, very complicated because the payer, provider, and patient, the stakeholder is different. And in Southeast Asia, the region is totally different. Uh, GDP, bad per capita, everything is different. When we think about the new business in a new region, we just want to start with a very small shot and wait and see and learn the industry. That is what we have done in Vietnam. Uh, if I may add, um, I think, um, you know, Southeast Asia is, we know it's not it's just one region, one country, right? Um, there are multiple uh, countries that are multiple, you know, maturity uh, in terms of healthcare and, and other, other, you know, um, uh, factors. So this is why we've came up with, uh, you know, um, different approaches for each country. Um, I think it depends a lot on, you know, um, uh, mostly on the regulatory environment and how uh, the government uh, is funding the healthcare system. You know, with, the, with a lot of countries, developing countries now adopting universal healthcare, you know, I think uh, it's really pushing a lot of, uh, they're pushing efforts to um, collect data. And, uh, you know, for example, Indonesia with the, their, you know, Satu Sehat, you know, the, the one app that aggregates all the information. So there's a good effort that's going on. Whereas in Singapore now with the, you know, Health SG, we're, trying, we're trying, to, trying to transition into more primary care, try to provide more tools to the GPs. And, but we, we, you know, they, the MOH also admit that this is going to take another decade. You know, it's going to be a three to eight year, you know, very long journey. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity where um, a digital healthcare um, uh, solution provider like Huray, which has tons of experience in Korea, can, can come in and help, you know, to, to provide, especially on the primary care and GP side, you know. Um, uh, Huray has other tools that, that helps, uh, you know, uh, large uh, health systems as well. Uh, but we're trying to focus more on providing, you know, effective tools to primary care uh, providers. Thank you. Um, can you walk us through a little bit about your revenue traction to date and maybe break it down by the three business models that you have? And separately, um, what's your uh, view or target for uh, entering the Singapore market? Is it, um, is it a, um, a market to secure more revenues or is it supposed to be a platform to uh, aid entry throughout the region? In the revenue side, uh, the sec uh, we have a business, uh, we define a digital health application business with a more high level digital transformation. Among our revenue for a digital transformation sector, it may be more than 60 or 70 percent. In a countrywide, uh, now Korea spends about uh, uh, 90 percent, uh, 95 percent, and Japan is all another 5%. Southeast Asia, the first third will be a small amount of uh, revenue. Why? We, we will earn a small amount of revenue in the very first. However, Southeast Asia is one of the fastest regions with a big market potential. So the uh, growth rate of the revenue will be very, will be most high among the Asia region business for now, I think. We still have time, so more questions, please. Um, on revenue, could you kind of elaborate a little bit more on the models, like in Vietnam and Indonesia, because they're quite different. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the the business model. How are you collecting revenue? Yeah. Uh, oh, for Vietnam, Indonesia, we do not collect any revenue now because in Vietnam, uh, we have just started the 
we, we have just launched the doctor around application uh, maybe two or three months ago. And the app is now for a kind of more uh, towards the public se sector now. How, and it will be operated by a kind of POC, POC stage. However, after the POC stage, we have planned to expand the customer base more large throughout the whole Vietnam. And, it, and after that, we can make an every revenue uh, might from hospital or the government too. In Indonesia, we didn't have launched the application not yet, however. With the same application, we have planned to launch the app in the U.S. market because the uh, U.S. market is the, uh, one of the regions that have a, have a very high, high willingness to pay. Hi high willingness to pay. And we have a region-specific strategy uh, on that. For example, Indonesia, uh, we think that we can uh, capture a high traffic. However, if it is connected to the telehealth solution, it will be more, more powerful. So in that case, that's why we want to collaborate and seeking a telehealth company in, in Indonesia, and we will find uh, how can we make money with them. Hi. Yes, thanks so much for the presentation earlier. Uh, just two questions from me. Uh, the first one would be regarding your uh, B2C strategy in Indonesia. Um, how do you plan to acquire customers there? And the second question is, you know, based on your um, success to date in Korea, what is the most successful product that you've launched? Uh, so right now we're not thinking about P2C strategy in Indonesia yet. Um, we hypothesize that um, there may be some collaboration possible with you know the likes of HelloDoc and Allo, you know Allo Doctor, uh, because a lot of their traffic actually comes from uh, pediatrics you know patients uh, that have fever uh, symptoms and par parents want to call you know make sure that their their ch children is okay. They don't need to take necessarily you know their, their kids to a doctor or ER, which can be very expensive, also not always accessible in countries like Indonesia. So, um, but uh, uh, we're also. As you saw in the slide, we're also trying to take an approach from a you know, public health perspective. You know, um, we, with, with the app, you know, um, we can create a heat map of the country and where the fever is uh, currently happening on a real-time basis. You, know, if you, you, you probably all know, uh, you know the, the NEA here in, in Singapore, they, they provide you a, a sort of a heat map around you know, dengue fever, right? But that data actually is not real time. It's it's a pretty uh, uh, it's a couple of days old, you know, because they have to identify and they have to diagnose it and make sure that it, it, it the, the data gets up, you know, uh, uploaded in the system. Um, but uh, you know, uh, so the advantage that we have is it's because it's a cloud based, you know, we collect data, um, you know, real time. Uh, we can draw this uh, heat map, you know, uh, in a real time basis. The second question. Yeah, for the second question, the most successful application in Korea was uh, uh, was was a high health challenge, which name is uh, sold for an uh, insurance company. The number of the uh, users at the very first was more than uh, ten thousand people, and after one or two years, the retention rate was thirty percent. We think that the reason that the high retention rate was that we have structure, structured well about the re reward system. And that was our best case. Okay, unfortunately we don't have time anymore. So uh, actually we have more networking time after DJ in here. So please share your opinion or question deeply with the entrepreneurs on the stage. Thank you so much. Here's the Hurray Positive Incorporate. Thank you so much. So now we wrap up the first stage of May Day and let's move on to the next team. So, so many industry and so many companies need AI solutions to use their own problem in their own industry, but it's not easy because AI engineers are kind of rare. So, and it's really a difficult area. But for solving this matter, let's meet Omnis Lab. Omnis Lab is a no-code ML platform provider for remote sensing image analysis and customized remote sensing ML software provider for public service and depends. Please welcome Kiwan Moon, CEO of Omnis Lab. Hello, welcome. When can I start? Can I start right now? Yes. I cannot see the concert, so. 
Under the monitor. Okay, let me start. I don't want you to disturb, uh, get disturbed. So, I'm a founder and CEO of Omnisource company. My name is Kui Hwan Moon. Uh, we are the maker of deepblog.net, a no-code computer vision AI model development platform that is cheaper, easier, faster than the software of Airbus. Over the last 10 years, the number of imaging satellites has grown 10 times. Today, more than thousands of satellites and aircraft capture petabytes of images every day. But the problem is there are nine of human eyes on Earth to go through all this data. Fortunately, recent progress of AI has made it possible to automate 80% of the analysis. But the problem is real sensing images are still analyzed by human. This is because of the technical difficulty of processing and handling real sensing images. The file size is too large, sometimes reaches around 10 gigabytes per each, and the resolution is too high. Moreover, a cutting edge machine learning technology must be developed and combined together with a large data processing technology to make a software solution for the remote sensing images. We're here to solve the problem. We believe that anyone has right to access the power of AI. We can do so by making an AI platform that is easy to use for everyone. So we created a deep block, a no-code computer vision AI platform. Users can start building their own machine learning model without any programming experience with our drag and drop interface if they use our platform. DeepLock is simple yet powerful software solution. Users can build machine learning models to detect any change or objects in image files. Our users use it for a wide range of applications, but especially for public service and surveillance. For now, we're focusing on object detection and change detection AI for remote sensing images to solve problem in the urban planning. Deep block is a pretty competitive solution in the market. We, Deep block has a powerful capability of processing the ultra high resolution images at a record speed. We have a complex computing technology to enable processing large image files with competitive pricing model. In conclusion, Deep block enables users to access the powerful computer vision AI for remote sensing. We help customers reduce costs by streamlining their AI research and automating the image analysis. Finally, we help customers successfully finish their geospatial projects in a few days instead of months. Now, let me explain why I'm in Singapore. Singapore is a strategic location in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian countries are quickly urbanizing and the naval tension in the region gets intense. As you know, in Singapore, the land is precious. This means we have to optimize the land use as best as we can and we have to protect the land as best as we can and we can definitely help it. The company behind Deep Block .net, Omnislabs company was founded in 2019 in South Korea with a diverse and dynamic research team from prestigious universities. We're working with public organizations in South Korea and we're tapping into new markets in Europe and North America. We're, we're eager to partner with Singaporean public and private entities like a land management department and just special companies. Terimakasi, xie xie. Thank you. Yam Seng. Okay, what a nice final uh, presentation. And by the way, I like your pictures on the presentation. So let's move on to the Q&A session. Judges, we have uh, 10 minutes. So please feel free to ask your question. You want to go first, please? Can I go? Try, uh, very interesting idea. Uh, uh, may I first understand that whether this uh, the deep block uh, technology is it only applicable to remote sensing images or also to 
normal photos, normal images. Of course, we can process normal image files. And I started my business just for creating a playground for AI. But eventually, I ended up like suffering from financial crisis of our company. So we struggled to find the market fit. So that's why we are focusing on geospatial market at the moment. Got it. Uh, I feel that remote sensing, the probably the government agencies or some very big companies uh, who need to collect this data, who have this data. So on one hand, I think the customer base might be a bit concentrated. On the other hand, I feel this is, uh, if especially in uh, now people talk about ESG, this is a highly uh, needed area so that people can, you know, the agencies can detect deforestation or uh, misuse of land uh, early. Right? Uh, yeah, that's why I think it's very uh, useful technology. Uh, so maybe before I pass on uh, the mic to the rest of the judges, uh, one final question for me that, uh, do you just provide the product or do you also provide the service to uh, make sense of the data and provide recommendations uh, to your clients? We are not satellite image provider, so we have to find like an image or data provider. And we only have a software technology. That's a kind of a limitation, but however, that's our specialty. So uh, we have to, uh, we, in, in the end, for example, for South Korean government entities, we have to customize our software and install our software. So that means that we have to eventually customize and provide services on our product uh, and something like custom customization. So we can also do it, and we already do it for many reasons. Yeah, I, I can imagine that because even they have the data, they may not be able to process the data, right? So yeah, inevitably, you probably, probably have to provide the service as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you usually sell to customers, or do you sell through a, a partner to customers? And what's the revenue break breakdown when you have to sell through partners? Uh, the problem of uh, government sales is that the procurement process takes too much time and there are a lot of regulation. But however, there are plenty of research funds in South Korea so that we can just survive without uh, even making revenue. Of course, we are making revenue from multiple sources in South Korea, but it's not that big. Of course, we are so far, we are a self financed company and then our annual revenue last year reached around four, uh, 0 0.4 million US dollar and without any investment and without any debt in our company. Uh, but in the future, I think that we can project our revenue by uh, per project, like an, it re reach around like 200,000 US dollar per year to maybe even 1 million US dollar per year. Because for example, uh, each local government in South Korea spends almost 1 million US dollar a year to just to detect illegal building construction and change of the land use for public administration in South Korea. Uh, okay, so since we heard from the open space uh, gentleman a little bit of a ESG impact, how compute intensive are your algorithms from the perspective of potentially um, wasting a lot of energy cycles uh, in a uh, cloud infrastructure? Uh... I cannot say because, like, uh, for example, so far in South Korea, for example, and almost all countries around the world, just to analyze remote sensing images manually with human resources and spend a lot of money. I think at least, even though we spend like um, some amount of electricity, I think still it's uh, more efficient and it's like um, uh, ecologically better and for the uh, the environment. So uh, first, we need to automate, and then we need to like uh, reduce uh, cost, and also we need to improve the efficiency of the analysis. Yeah, I, I think my suggestion is uh, maybe you can position your offering as providing similar uh, quality of, of analysis, but maybe because you have a more efficient algorithm, you can do it at 30% less energy cost to uh, something happening at the data. Yes, center. sir, I improve my deck and also our revenue projection and also like an, our kind of like a contribution to the society and the uh, environment. Yes, in South Korea. Do you remember that protects your competitive IP? I uh, just want to understand how the patent, what areas you can cover. Uh, we are a software company. Our background is computer science. Compared to other geospatial companies, we have strong competence and the competitive advantage over 
the software engineering. So uh, I think like in Korea, the patent law is not uh, friendly for enterprise and small startups to protect their IP. But however, at least we're a small team. And then, for example, I started my company with my classmate. So for now, I think it's pretty difficult to like copy unless they steal our source code. But however, maybe I think we need to protect our intellectual properties in the future by like uh, registering more patents. Uh, I'm not asking about your patent strategy. Yes. I'm asking what do the patents cover? What are you trying to protect? Uh, for example, how to process high resolution imagery uh, uh, and also for about just, just general layout of our product because it's a simple point and click, drag or do interface. And what was it? Uh, two of them are c covering the general layout and the like workflow of our software, and one is like um, relying on the like uh, pro how we process uh, large image files uh, at scale and in in short time. Yes. Yes, we still have time, so let's go ahead. Maybe I'll just add one question to a couple of other questions before. You said you use primarily you have a no code platform or a low code platform. Yes. Is that for the end client, or is that for developers who want to build use cases using your technology? Uh, for now, it's a graphical interface, but we do offer API for free. Uh, I mean, yeah, we don't have to differentiate the pricing model at the moment because individual users are, are not paying that much. That's a problem that we have. Uh, but however, eventually they have they really kind of like bring maybe corporate or like a government entities to our uh, company, and then maybe we can make sales. Uh, so. Uh, it's a graphical, we don't first graphical interface, so users can run inference by just unloading image files with drag and drop action, but also users can use programmer interface that we provide through our API service. Yes. Got it. Earlier you said the government procurement process can be quite complicated and quite long. Yes. For the other corporate or the developers, how do you sign them up? What's your actual sign up process? Uh, South Korea and geospatial, that's why we want to go out abroad. Uh, that's, why, that's why we want to go to abroad. For example, South Korea and geospatial market is small. But however, for example, uh, the entire geospatial uh, images, like remote sensing images, are controlled, heavily controlled by the government in South Korea. But the, however, uh, for example, European countries or United States, there are commercial satellite image providers in the market, and then we want to find more use cases in the market. For now, we couldn't find many corporate customers in South Korea, but it's my mission, I think. We already have plenty of things to do in South Korea, and where's more, but in the future, um, it's my mission and it's my task to expand our market and audience group, like uh, finding more corporate customers and enterprises. Thank you. Okay, is there any more questions? We can get one more question for this team. I'll ask a question. Yeah. So I, I saw that your SES subscription um, plan is actually quite wide, ranging between $10 to 300 So just curious, like, um, once who's your target customer for this group, and what, what would be the average contract size? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the reason uh, why we developed and we specialize like on our product to geospatial market is that geospatial analysts are not good at software engineering and programming. The problem is that they manually just to analyze their image files, and then, for example, they want to just like analyze. Mainly, we have a preliminary survey before allowing users to signing up our platform. Uh, we offer free trial, and we found that these days usually defense officers. Uh, subscribe our ebook and also our product and check our product and signing up our platform. And just special analysts, for example, uh, they have sometimes different profile research, researchers in public institutes, for example, and research organizations. They just want to analyze satellite images, as I mentioned, because they have no skills on machine learning and computer science, but also they have to analyze tons of image files. Okay, more comments? Okay, thank you so much. Now we're gonna wrap up the second stage. Thank you so much. Here's the Munki Han CEO from Omni Labs. Thank you. Omni Labs. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to the third stage. Um, maybe almost all of us have more, more than one insurance, but insurance company insurance industry is still big, but still have many problems that we need to solve because it's complicated and difficult for just normal people. So now 
For this matter, let's move on to this team, Great Health Chains, which provides an indicator that changes the methodology of making health insurance product and advancing underwriting process. So please welcome Jay Kim, CFO of Great Health Chain. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for welcoming. Uh, I am Jay Kim from Great Health Chain. We are an tech company in Korea, and we are trying to make some kind of innovation in Singapore and Southeast Asia market. So uh, these are the problems we are facing in the insurance markets. So consumers, they do not know about the insurance. They do not believe in insurance. Uh, let's talk about the insurers. Do they know their customers? They really don't know because they only get the data from the questionnaires of consumers. Uh, these kind of problems comes because there are no indicators linking these two needs. So that's why we have came up with this indicator, health grade. It works like a FICO score in credit market. So insurance didn't have any kind of indicator like this, which means they did not know about what kind of uh, risk their consumers are possessed. And even consumers, they didn't really know about their health status because without health grade, they would not know how healthy they are at, your, at their age and their gender. So this becomes an insurance solution like this. Uh, we give relative ratio incident rate and a lot of actuarial assumptions to the product, which means low risk people will have low premium. And even if you start with high premium, the premium will get lower when, you're, when you give your effort into your health. And when your health gets better, your premium will go down. Uh, until now, same age, same gender meant same premium and the premium did not change whole through the policy. It's not reasonable, so we are making the reasonable uh, premium methodology in insurance. And we give some kind of major disease predictions to the insurers, which means we can advance the underwriting solutions. Uh, these are really working in Korea right now and we are having about 14 uh, insurers using our solutions. So these are the impact on insurance after health grade adop adoption. So if you look at the upside, that is the thing it's working on insurance. So after issue period, consumer claims, insurance pay, consumers claim, insurance pay, and the policy is terminate. Can insurance tell it's their consumers? It's not because they do not know about their consumers, even if they have to protect them about 20 years. But with, with health grade, it changes a lot. We have this periodic times to uh, calculate health grade. At that time, insurers get the data and the consumers will have some kind of like uh, premium discounts or they can get some kind of customized health care or other health care which means they are three points that insurance can have. They have improvement of KYC, and their pricing will be more dynamic than before, which means they can take care of their loss ratio. And third part, the retention ratio will go up because they'll have much more touch points than before. Then what about customers? It's really hard for them to understand uh, insurance. Even people in financial field does not know about insurance because it's a really different logic. But we can tell them if you take your effort in your health care, your premium will go down. It's much more reasonable and it's making motivation of being healthier through the financial benefits. And through this, we're trying to establish trust and reliability with consumers and insurers. Uh, with these kind of businesses, we have gathered really a lot of data, the health data, because we use health checkup data and medical usage record. With that, we are trying to drive uh, a lot of solution through data, so customized healthcare services and marketing solution for agents. And we are actually uh, on research of alternative credit rating using the health data. And also we are trying to make some kind of data subscription uh, platforms which uh, a company like JMDC does. Well, we have 
initially uh, launched the product in December 2020. And last year, we had made some partnership with small, medium size. Uh, in two years ago, we had made partnership with small, medium sized insurers. At the end of last year, we have made partnership with the major companies. Now we have partnership with top tier companies right now. And with them, we are thinking of making really explosive growth of ourselves. But we want to make ourselves into Singapore. The reason is this Singapore, all the global insurances, Asia region is in Singapore, which means when we can make ourselves in Singapore and when we make business, it means that we can go into Indonesia, we can go into Malaysia because it works in Singapore and Singapore controls a lot of Southeast Asia market. With these, we are making this kind of roadmap. We want to do the POC and check the regulation this year. We are trying to make some JVs and branches next year. And in 2025, we are trying to expand ourselves into Southeast Asia market, expand wide. And we are looking for insurance partners, investors, and solution providers like telemeds or hospitals. This is our team. We are all from insurance side. We are experts in insurance. We have worked together in global reinsurance uh, company in Korea branch. Uh, we truly believe that insurance should take care of people's health. And we are trying to innovate insurance, not by making process easier or not by making comfortable. We are trying to redefine the definition of insurance, not protection, but it should be the motivation of making people healthier. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So let's move on to the Q&A session. So judges, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Santo Ventures, please. So, so thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, answer perhaps a, a simple question, uh, which is, who does GHC really serve? Is it the, um, the ins insured or is it the insurers? Uh, okay, L I want to talk about how it works in Korea. So this indicator, all the consumer, not the insurance consumers, can come into our app and see their indicators. But we get paid from the insurance companies because we give them what kind of uh, risk their consumers possesses, and we give them what kind, uh, by adopting our solution, insurance can have more deeper dive understanding about the portfolio they have, because they do not know about the health status of their consumers. So they pay us by using our indicators. So mostly we are like a B2B business uh, platform, but we have to gather data from customers. So we have to make some kind of benefits that the benefit we are trying to make is make them get their insurance premium lower. Right. So if I'm an insurance company, why would I need to buy a solution that would lower my insurance premium revenues? Uh, okay. I want to talk about two things about that. First, insurance companies are doing it right now. They're using steps. They're using some kind of questionnaires to gather data, and they give some kind of premium discounts. But these premium discounts are more like a marketing expense, not change the risk rate itself. The reason they are doing is they want to collect the data, but is that, that significant data? We are not sure of it. That's at one point. And secondly, they need data because they have to uh, face a lot of things from outside, like in Korea, uh, the insurance have to convert themselves into IFR 17, which means they have to do much deeper uh, risk uh, assessment than before because all things should be cash flow based. Then they need to have data about their consumers, but until now they really don't have data. That's the big problem they are facing. So for these two reasons, 14 insurance are adopting our solution right now. I think it comes same in Singapore also, because we have seen a lot of Singapore companies and other global companies doing something like this, but they're mostly using steps right now. Okay, so sorry, I'm gonna stay on this point. Uh, are you helping insurers go after new revenue streams that would not have been possible because the uh, the insurance premium would have been too high based on the existing system? 
or are you allowing insurers to reduce their loss ratio by quickly turning through and sort of weeding out the bad apples from their, uh, from their insured base? Uh, yeah, we are trying to do it at the same time. Of course, uh, at this moment, they're thinking of making loss ratio going down. But there are much more different strategies they are using because, well, the insurance are sold by agents. Agents want their people to have much more sum assured than before. Like they want to make them have like five million cancer, not three million cancer coverages. And insurance doesn't have any data to make them happen because they cannot uh, hire the sum assured because they do not know about the risk. And by that, they can gather much more risk premium than before. These strategies go at the same time, but for the most reason why they're using right now is about reducing loss ratio and gathering data. Okay, so we still have some time to solve our curious about this team. So, okay, please go ahead. Um, can you share a little bit more about competition? Uh, competition, okay, mm -hmm. so worldwide there are uh, Vitality, which is the most famous one to have health promoting solutions and we know a uh, biological age model which well my former company score and Garmin does and there are things but the real difference is they do not have actuarial base to change the risk rate like I said they are more like having discount on the marketing expense side so it's more like an additional service but for us we are trying to be like an indicator changing the real premium so that's the difference we are facing. Of course, they have much bigger platforms. Well, they have much more market shares right now, especially in Singapore. But what we are trying to give them is, we can give actuarial assumptions. We can give them how to make much more innovative products than before. But others, it's really hard because they cannot convert their model quite easily. But we have references in Korea. Uh, our model is really approved by our FSS and FSC. So with these references, we can be adopted quite much more quickly than other companies. Uh, may I understand, is there any minimum percentage uh, of participants uh, for the insurer to be able to offer dynamic pricing? So maybe let me rephrase my question. Assuming that I'm an insurer, I'm selling a policy which, uh, which has one million uh, policyholders every year. So what's the minim minimum number of uh, participants uh, from your platform for me to make a decision that I can offer dyn dyn dynamic pricing? Uh, okay, so our grade has nine group, nine grades, which means nine groups. So the difference is now they only have one groups. We make it nine, which means everybody can be in the dynamic pricing field. And secondly, why we have done it is because we wanted to change the homogeneity of risk that insurance are looking at. This is a really important thing because the insurance itself has to look at the homogeneity of risk. But before, they did not have, have any solutions to look at it. That's the reason they try to make it as a whole. They just saw it as a one like uh, standard thing. But we are trying to make it nine. We have made it nine. So all the customers inside will be having this kind of dynamic pricing. Uh, I believe the insurers are already uh, putting people in different band, each band uh, of gender, of course, and then the premium varies, normally increases with the age, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, this relative ratio does not, uh, it, it reflects the age. So it means how healthy you are at your age and gender. So which means as they grow older, their grades follow it. So all of them would follow the grades, even though they age. So it doesn't mean that if you're old, you will have like, bad grades. If you're young, you'll have good, good grades. It's not like that. It's working like, well, I'm age 38. And if I am like grade three, it means that I'm like a uh, top 30% healthy pe person in my age. 
So that's the reason we can do dynamic pricing all through the policy life. And uh, maybe a very quick one. So do you look, so when you evaluate the users, uh, do you look at uh, medical history or mental history plus exercise history? Uh, what we are using right now in Korea is health checkup data, medical usage record, and we use steps also. But we have to convert our model into Singapore because the accessible data would be really different. We know that that's the reason we want to make some POCs this year, because we have to know what kind of data would be accessible and what kind of partnership we can make to make this model work in Singapore. That's the reason we are taking the first step into Singapore and I hope people here would well likely to help us, then we can do really a lot of business together. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we ran out of the time, so let's conclude this presentation for now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We had a Jay Kim CFO from Great Health Chain. So let's move on to FMB industry. So including Metisubstitute, bigger market is getting bigger and spreading out all over the world by the matter of the environment, health, or the, just for the taste and so on. So this team is also about this market. So we meet to find an alternative whole can made from mushrooms. Please welcome Hyunseok Han San, CEO of We Meet on the stage. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today. And my name is Hyun Seok, and I'm the CEO of Wimit. Um, Plant-based meat have uh, received a lot of attention over the years, but how often do we actually consume them? Uh, is there anyone who actually eats this one at least once a week? <laughs> Nobody, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, as we see here, um, unfortunately, the market um, impact is still minimal. In the United States, um, the plant-based meat consumption is only just 1% compared to the traditional meat consumption. And many people who have tried are not satisfied. So far, most meat alternatives are not uh, meeting the consumer's expectations. Even if it is plant-based, um, many people actually um, expect that this should be delicious and the food uh, should be uh, healthy and even healthier as it is the plant-based and the, the, the available in our daily lives. But uh, the conventional way of alternative meat development has its inherent limitation. So most products are um, use the base material made from soybean, um, which is called TBP. Uh, but people do not prefer the bean flavor from soybean, also the texture from TBP. So many companies add the extra texture, extra process, processing um, to mask those uh, taste or tex texture off, and which in, it raises the, um, the issues of the health. Also, TBP is um, suitable for the mid-ground applications. So um, it is the um, um, relatively um, a few options that we can utilize like the uh, Western cuisines. So it is necessary to uh, reassess the feasibility of the uh, conventional meat alternative uh, development and redesign the process to go beyond the uh, limitations. So the women fundamentally innovate the process from material to uh, applications. Women use um, fungal material, including mushrooms, instead of soybeans. And we minimize the processing as natural, as simple as possible to make it uh, genuinely healthier. Also, women aims to become all-purpose meat, covering the uh, various types of livestock and also the various uh, cooking situation, which can be used in our daily uh, use. Um, all, so the mushroom is actually has a lot of um, advantages compared to the soybean. Mushroom um, has um, 
its own savory taste and fiber structure, which is good for meat developments. And also, it is relatively free from the allergy or GMO issues, and even people perceive these as a premium ingredient compared to the soybean. And how do mushrooms turn into meats? There are two different approaches. Uh, first, with the mushroom, mushroom needs to be uh, blended with other um, plant-based uh, protein in terms of the uh, whole cup applications. And also, we are um, exploring the mycelium to create the uh, whole cup application as it has its own fiber structure. And uh, for the ground meat application, we developed the mycelium and mycelium mushroom complex um, through the uh, solid state fermentation. And it, um, by this um, technology, uh, the mycelium can hold the other materials together and it um, creates the meat like uh, ta the mouthfeel. So we introduced we meat in 2021 in the form of the Korean style um, fried chicken. And it has a uh, high protein and fiber contents with less fat and zero cholesterol. So it appeals to those who love the uh, taste of the fried chicken, but um, search for a healthier option. So um, since the launch, we have received the positive feedback from the domestic consumers and we supply our products to local uh, F&B services like restaurants. And we are currently taking a step further by pushing our boundary to B2B business, uh, supplying our product, the semi finalized product, and also the providing the solution for the hybrid meats for the cultivated meat industry. Uh, 2023 is the first year that uh, we introduce WeMeet uh, globally. So we need to um, verify our competitiveness as well as they are securing uh, the business partner in the global market. And in that regard, Singapore is the good place to start because uh, Singapore is one of the driving forces of the global food uh, system innovation. So there are many um, global meat alternative companies here and we can see uh, where we are and now and how can we um, position ourselves. Also, Singapore has a good infrastructure in terms of technology and business. And even the government back this um, industry actively. So it is a great place for us to um, lay the foundation for the global exp expansion. So I am confident that um, my uh, team and I will trailblaze this uh, unknown path well because we are mission-oriented team and, um, for example, all majority are actually um, on the uh, veteran-related diet, so, um, which means that many, uh, they, we are pa genuinely passionate about making our product popular. So uh, lastly, uh, the word meat in Korean, we said gogi, and converting this word to a Chinese character meaning high energy. So that makes sense uh, in that um, animal meat actually provides the uh, honey high energy through the uh, protein or fat. And then what if the energy comes from the different source besides the animal meats, uh, which can be more sustainable? Uh, my team and I, this is the reason why my team and I are striving to spread we meat to supply positive energy to the world for a positive future. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So let's move on to the Q&A session. So please feel free to ask. Oh, okay, he first and then please do the next. Hi, yes. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I like the fact that you are going the fungi route. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a lot of potential to be unlocked there. Uh, but I think my question is slightly broader. So it's on uh, market timing, right? So given that there are so many plant-based alternatives these days and it's becoming more of like a commodity, mm -hmm. why do you think now is the right timing and why, and, and I guess, why do you think the market is ready for another plant-based option? So, yeah, this is really good question. And I think many people are already aware of how uh, severe the current situation is related to food system. But the thing is, there is not relevant option for us to choose um, I mean, in terms of the um, um, preference uh, food-wise. So, and I see the problem is actually the... Uh, um, the base material made from soybean, because soybean has a beanie flavor. Also, the way to make it, um, which is the extrusion, it makes, creates the base material as the spongy-like texture. So 
uh, this is uh, my proposal that we have to change and the conventional way of uh, alternative meat development to the new approach, which comes from soybean, which is uh, mushroom-based uh, development. Mm. I guess it's a follow-up question to that, right? Um, how, how will you position the product vis-a-vis -vis the other options that are out there in the market? So for example, for mushroom, there's also players like Fable mm -hmm. that's already been working with different food services. So mm -hmm. how different, how similar are you to them, and what's the positioning? Yes, so um, Faber focus on beef-like products, and we start from chicken because chicken is the most universal meat uh, in terms of um, culture, religion, and, and cooking-wise. So um, the end product and application is currently different, and I think they might not um, explore the fermentation technology, but we uh, built up the uh, technology related to fermentation, which can be our own core assets to be differentiated from the uh, uh, fable. Got it. Got it. I'll just add one final comment. I think, you know, like uh, everybody loves Korean fried chicken, so I think it's a good uh, kind of starting point in terms of application. Yeah. But I think being uh, in this part of the world, in Asia, and also trying to expand into Southeast Asia, it would be interesting to see the other applications of chicken meat. So like steamed, right. stir-fried, boiled. I mean, these are applications that, you know, very few players have actually tried to crack. Mm -hmm. right? So I think um, it would be interesting if you can crack those, and I look forward to your development. Yes. Um, so in Southeast Asia, there are a lot of... Um, localized chicken applications like here, Hainan rice, uh, the chicken rice, and also Indonesia, maybe nasi goreng or the other uh, type of the chicken applications. So um, it is very interesting to see how it evolves here uh, from the uh, base of our um, the whole cup meat. Okay, so Santo Ventures, please. So thank you. Uh, can you maybe talk a bit more about the uh, the IP situation and um, who do you see as potentially the biggest competitor for you in this space, especially when you broaden your uh, footprint into Southeast Asia? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So for the IP, we are currently holding for the uh, two IPs for the mushroom mycelium complex and the the processing the um, mushroom for. Uh, the, the meat alternative. So, um, and also we will um, offer for the new patents in this first half, and our plan is to apply for another one in the uh, second half. And the, sorry, the second question is? Who's your competitor, do you think, once you uh, start expanding abroad? Yes, um, so there are a few uh, companies related to fermentation or um, mycelium. And for now, I see uh, Meaty in the uh, United States. They are uh, one of the comp competitors that I uh, should consider. And actually, they already uh, dive into the uh, mycelium haircut uh, meat uh, product, uh, which we are also aiming to achieve in the next few years. So yeah, I think they, they are our, uh, one of our competitors. Sure. Um, from a product marketing perspective, um, how do you think about overcoming the negativity or the, um, the, uh, the notion that eating mushrooms and fungus is not necessarily that attractive or enticing? Yeah, um, well, in terms of mushroom, I'm not sure uh, how people think this in a negative way, um, but in terms of fungus, fungi, maybe, um, but um, maybe I, we... Sorry, uh, let me add. So I can imagine my son coming to me saying, Daddy, I really want to eat chicken, mm -hmm. but I don't think he will come to me saying, Daddy, I want to eat mushroom. And uh, so for some people, they'll remember this being mushroom-based. And how will you go around sort of creating the right perception? Yeah, so um, maybe for the, um, the fungus thing, I think, um, uh, I think it would be better to communicate with the more familiar terms, which is um, mushroom, um, because people have some kind of perception related to mushroom. And also um, regarding the uh, um, 
the role of repl replacement of the meats, I think uh, rather uh, instead of um, imitating 100% of the uh, all the properties of the chicken, I rather try to be positioned as the um, the, top, the just the new meat uh, which comes from um, mushroom. So like um, in the past in in uh, in the past 50 years ago, um, we have the soy-based meat which uh, become unpopular. But what if it become popular? People think that this is just a soy uh, soy-based meat. So uh, likewise, although it is not 100% uh, similar um, um, case, but uh, I'd like to position this one as uh, just a new type of meat, um, along with other traditional meats like. Uh, um, chicken, beef, or pork. So maybe a quick one. Uh, how much cheaper is your product compared to the original meat? Oh, yes. Uh, for now, it's uh, also just a matter of the um, scale up issue. So we uh, secured the seed money um, uh, one and a half years ago, and we set up the uh, self-manufacturing facility, which uh, should be small. So uh, in in that regard, our manufacturing cost is a little bit high, but now we are expanding our factory into the double size, so the cost will be down around 50% 50 around. Cheaper. Yeah, cheaper than the, the, the price of the sell, current selling, uh, the manufacturing cost. Okay, thank you so much. We spend all time we have for this stage, so we're gonna wrap up this stage. But before we finish, uh, here's the good news for everyone because we meet to bring the chicken <laughs> from Korea. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I will uh, prepare uh, our product over there. So, please, uh, I, I'm more than happy to have your feedback. Thank you. You go ahead, you can, you can say that. Is, is it chicken and beer or just chicken? Only chicken, but beer after <laughs> networking. <laughs> okay, you can bring it. So, <laughs> okay, so we have one more team. So the first stage made made us super hungry. Like uh, mentioning about so many foods name, <laughs> but now it's time to move on more serious problem for our life because. For it's, it's, it becomes social issues because so many people are struggling to get a baby when they try to get a baby. So this team can help this social, uh, can help to solve this matter. So let's meet Kai Health, which provides a fertility AI solution that increases the pregnancy rate by selecting the best embryo. So please welcome with your applause. Hejun Lee, CEO of Kai Healthcare on the stage. All right, everyone, this is the last show, so please pay attention. <laughs> okay, I'm Hejun Lee, a gynecologist and CEO of Kai Health. So one in six couples suffer from infertility. That's more than you think. But fertility treatment is expensive and has a low success rate. And the success largely depends on embryo quality. So at Kai Health, we focus on increasing the embryo quality by helping generating the best embryo by modifying lifestyle. And second, culturing the embryo in the personalized and best way. And third, selecting the best embryo for transfer. With the limited time, we're gonna focus on embryo selection today. The current embryo selection process is subjective and very invasive. We depend on embryologists' eyes and experience, and genetic testing is very invasive, and it's not allowed in countries like Singapore. So at Kai Health, using AI, we wanna change this embryo selection methodology in an objective and non-invasive way. So we collect data from 12 clinics in South Korea and one clinic from Malaysia and one network in the US and we're talking with three Singapore IVF clinics. With the data we collected, we developed so far five algorithms including pregnancy prediction and blastulation prediction. I'll show you a little bit of our product. So our product is a cloud-based solution so you can either take a picture or upload your embryo images. 
And within a second, our AI solution will tell you what is the best embryo. Then you can actually save it and then generate a report and all of those. Um, and then we checked if it actually works in a clinical setting. So before we actually do the clinical trial at hospitals using patient's embryo, we tested it out with a blind test, um, so with images. And embryologist uh, accuracy was 36 to 37 percent without using AI assistance. But with AI score, their accuracy went up by 10 percent. And AI alone could predict the pregnancy 25 percent higher than embryologists. So it means less time to pregnancy and less cost. We launched our product in February 2023. We were a very young company. And within three months, we contracted with four clinics. Our solution is a software as a medical device. So pre-approval, we sell to directly to the clinics and um, uh, collect payment annually. And after approval, we can actually collect money from patient through the clinic. We all think AI solution is just not easy to make money, but I think fertility market is different. It's expensive, out of pocket, and the willingness to pay is really high, and patients spend thousands of dollars on optional treatment, and we're going to become one of those options. Our global strategy includes in, no, U.S. and Spain because of the market size. Sorry, I'm checking the time. And Asia is actually one of the top priorities because there's no competitors. We are the only player in Asia and with a very large data set. And Singapore is very important to us because obviously it's a hub. If you want to expand in Asia, you've got to come to Singapore. And also because it's a mixture of public and private services, it's an ideal place to run a POC. And because Singapore is a medical hub for tourism, you know, it's easy to take all this diverse data with the race and different uh, ethnicity, which is essential for AI development. I'm a gynecologist. And I was practicing as an IVF doctor 10 years ago. I quit practicing. And I went to MBA, and I worked in a healthcare tech industries for a while in Silicon Valley. And my team understands fertility data, and we are ready to go global. And we are backed by Smilegate Investment and TransLink for here, and we are a proud DCAMP family. <laughs> Our vision is to become a family tech company, starting with fertility treatment, fertility care, all the way to egg freezing and contraception. So we want to help people to build healthy family. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to the Q&A session. Please go ahead, yeah. Center Ventures. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess I have a couple of questions. So how important is to have approval? I mean, can you survive uh, in a pre-approval state with just the SaaS revenue? And secondly, uh, can you talk a little bit about the sequence of regulatory approval roadmap you have in mind? Do you want to get approved in certain countries first? Sure. Um, so to answer your question, the, the first one, so SaaS is, you know, it's, it's important to keep the revenue going, but the real revenue is actually going to come after post-approval. So our approval regulatory um, strategy is to get KFDA first. Obviously, we are in Korea, so we get that done next year. And then we're going to go for FDA and CE so that we get an easy food in the door in Singapore. I was talking to Singapore phys physicians, and they recommended that we get those first before coming to Singapore. So uh, we've obviously seen a lot of image-related AI in the market, right? Um, I understand you said in Southeast Asia, no one else is doing something like this. How many other people are doing similar things in the US and Europe? Yeah, so there is one player in the U.S. currently. Uh, there's no FDA-approved product so far, so we're waiting for the first product to be FDA-approved. And there are a couple more uh, in, uh, in Australia, uh, two in Israel. 
but not in Asia. I think the barrier to entry is a little high. At an OBGYN, before I became an I IVF specialist, I knew nothing about IVF. And also, even as a doctor, I didn't know what was going on in the lab. So there is like a multiple barriers to entry. So are you saying that in the US, um, no one else has got approval? That does not mean no one else is working on it, right? There could be someone else like you sitting in, in the scene. There is one company I know that's working on it. And I understand there's some amount of domain knowledge. Um, it, it's not just AI knowledge, it's also, like you said, medical knowledge. Um, but that's not unique. What, what I mean is there, there are many people who have IVF knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of people who have trained in that. Yep. Thousands in AI as well. Are you confident that no one else could actually replicate what you're doing, maybe in a different way? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think AI companies all hate that question. Um, but yeah, so the number of da data, the amount of data actually matters, but at the same time, having a large diverse data set also matters. And what we did last year was to actually label all those important features of an embryo. So for example, like ICM, it's just like inner cell mess becomes the fetus. So we label those uh, so that we can use it to train our AI model so that you know it could be more a generalized model. So I think that's one uh, competitive advantage we have. And second is that we uh, want to make sure that we cover throughout the IVF journey, starting from egg and culture and all the way through embryo selection. That's the only company that, you know, that's doing it. So I think that's a second advantage. What kind of liabilities um, would you be exposed to if you're using AI to do embryo selection? Uh, Can you repeat the question, please? What kind of liabilities that you potentially may be exposed to? Right, right. So uh, the decisions actually made by embryologists and physicians. So AI solutions are usually used as a clinical decision support tool. So liability is always with physician and medical staff. Okay. Yeah, my, my question is that uh, uh, just now you mentioned that your post approval, you will collect the payment from the patients, right? But it feels to me that you are actually selling this solution, whether it's SaaS or, or whatever. To the, uh, to the doctors, not to the patients directly. Right. Correct, so when you go to the clinic, you usually select uh, like the blood test, right? And then you pay for it. And then the, the clinic collects the payment from you and then they send some of the money to the, the lab. So that's how things work. Right, so, so, so basically, sharing. I guess eventually this will cut down the cost for all the patients, right? If doctors adopt your solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's eventually how the cost saving pass on to the patients. I don't think I understand. Sorry, sorry, I, I, sorry I'm trying to clarify the business model because mm -hmm. this feels to me is a B2B product. Mm -hmm. You're basically sending to the labs or the doctors. So the patients will pay the doctors for the whole package. So meaning that when they adopt your solution, the whole fertility process will be shortened, hence reduce cost. Uh, that cost saving will eventually be transla uh, 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 translated into s patient saving. Okay. Is that yes, the correct? That would be, yeah, that's, there will be a saving for patients because you, know, you don't have to go through multiple cycles. You can just get it done within less than uh, cycles than you would do without the AI solution. So I think, I don't know if I understand your question correctly, but uh, the KPI of a fertility IVF clinic is actually pregnancy rate. So they don't want patients to come back after failure. More repetitive failure is not their KPI just to increase the revenue. So they want to make sure you get pregnant once at once. Maybe I have a follow-up question. During your presentation, you said because of lack of time, you'll focus primarily on the embryo selection. Could you say a little bit about the other two steps, the, you know, the exercise and all that? Sure, yeah, so we only have five minutes to cover, but the, we are seriously working on how to improve the embryo quality because these days a lot of women get married late, so after 40, you don't have that many embryos to select from, so you only have one embryo, then what are you gonna do? So that's the issue that everyone's facing these days, so we wanna really make sure that you know, even older women, you know, you have the best treatment for your one single egg. 
So that's how we are doing a study with our partner in Korea. Uh, we are currently using mouse egg to test out if there's a best culture condition depending on the egg images. So that's the second product. And the first product that the increasing the embryo quality is by changing before you even produce it, the egg. So women are born with a certain amount of eggs, but they decrease uh, as you age. But there is a period that uh, when you start your period and then you start the whole hormone stimulation, there's a period that you can actually take care of yourself better to create the better eggs. So right now, you are just taking multiple vitamins and supplements, just anything you grab, like spend thousands of dollars on it. But we want to make it as a data-driven approach by combining patient-reported outcome with the medical data. So I'm assuming no one else has a question, so I'm keep, I'll just keep going. <laughs> on, right. on that bit, is that to do with AI imaging, or is that something completely different? So the first product to increase the egg quality would be more like a digital twin. So what we're thinking about is, here's your pregnancy rate I'm predicting, and then if you change your BMI a little bit, or if you stop smoking, then your chance of a pregnancy increases this much. And then we can also do like a challenge and those kind of things. And okay, if you run like 10 miles a day, then I'll give you a coupon for a supplement, something like that. So we are trying to do that as a B2B2C rather than just directly going to B2C. Okay, if you guys have any short comments or question, like a simple question, please go ahead. But if not, okay. Yeah, maybe a very quick one, right? So you mentioned Singapore and Malaysia uh, as your first entry to Southeast Asia. I'm curious why not Thailand? Because Thailand is also very famous for medical tourism. Yeah, yeah, Thailand is definitely one of the uh, top priorities right now. I think it's rising right now. I think before uh, people were actually coming to Singapore for more treatment. Now people are going to Thailand, so it's a new trend. So, you know, traditionally, uh, naturally you will think you want to come to Singapore and Malaysia first. Uh, now I'm learning more and more about that market. Thailand, yeah, seems like a very attractive option. Okay, thank you so much. We spent all time for the Kai Healthcare's. Please give the big applause for her as the last stage of May Day. Thank you so much. So, please, judges, finish your scoring for the five amazing startups for today. And during the scoring from the judges, we have prepared a small event for the audience. Unfortunately, just the audience for on site, not for the YouTube watch viewers. So, okay, so we prepared the lucky draw for making some time for judges. <laughs> okay, so we have business card inside of this clear box. So is there anyone who didn't put your business card yet into here? And if you want, here's the last chance to put in the business card into the box. So no? Why? Okay. <laughs> Wireless mic, it's really good to go. <laughs> Okay, is there anyone more to put your business card into the box? Okay, done. Five, four, three, judges, <laughs> two. Actually, last, uh, last Global Demo Day, one of the judges got the prize from the Lucky Draw. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's move on to Lucky Draw. So we prepared the handkerchief, three handkerchiefs from Korea with the old Korean amazing patterns, like traditional patterns inside. So we will pick up three people from this box. So, Mr. Director, please pick up the one for audience, please. Okay, so we get a uh, Certified public accountant from Deloitte, Gampi Asama. Is he here? Where? Is he here? Oh! Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> You're gonna get the gift, to so sell. at least you need to show up on the YouTube. <laughs> Let's come up on the stage. Okay. I don't know which one is which color, so pick up the one. Okay, thank you so much. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Genpei from Deloitte. So, yeah, uh, the pitching was very amazing. 
So thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. And one, pick up the wall first. Oh, picture first. <laughs> oh, was it? Was that in? <laughs> Can you announce? So, do, hmm? how, how, how can I pronounce it? So, do we international? So, su, si, kin, san. Sorry. Okay. Su, si, kin from do we international is here, here. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations! So pick up the one. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Suji from Do International, semiconductor related. Uh, and family office, so we invest back cash into startups as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Picture time. <laughs> okay, the last. Where are you going? Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Can you pick up the last one, please? For everyone? Okay, thank you so much. The last person for the lucky draw is Thomas Ip from Wilt Venture Builder. Is he here? Oh! Kinder gift! Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Please introduce yourself for everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Thomas from, from Singapore. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for being my mic keeper as well. So, okay, so we've finished the lucky draw for now. And now is the main time to move on the ceremony for the award. We have two awards out of five amazing startups for today. So I have the name of the team. Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> yeah, 10 seconds later, <laughs> 10 seconds later, because I'm not going to give the award because we have a special guest for this. So today we have two awards. One is the uh, Best Dream Award and one is the IMEA Best New Entrance Award. So for the Best Dream Award, we have a special guest to give an award for the startup. Please welcome Ambassador of the Republic of Korea, Choi Hoon, to Singapore. Um, yeah, it's really hard to meet him in person, so please introduce you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Choi Hoon. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, my name is Choi Hoon, uh, the Ambassador of South Korea uh, to the Singapore. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let me begin uh, uh, by express my uh, congratulations uh, to IMDA and DCAMP uh, to host uh, such a wonderful, you know, event. Uh, so, I rem as far as you remember, uh, last time I facilitated both, both, you know, the institution to uh, make a memorandum of understanding on the cooperation. So I'm truly, you know, uh, grateful and truly honored to uh, be here today. Uh, as you know, uh, as was well known, uh, the Singapore is a, a city state with a business friendly environment and a well organized infrastructure. So I think, uh, you know, uh, the companies uh, present here today, so we'll have a chance to uh, uh, get through uh, the Asian market uh, with the uh, uh, support of the Singaporean counterpart. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I'm again, once again, I'm, I'm very honored to be here to join the uh, wedding ceremony. Uh, thank you very much for again. And uh, I believe so most, uh, all of the uh, company present here, so we become the next uh, Google-like or you know, Amazon-like uh, super corporations uh, near in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. We are under really positive pressure, right? So <laughs> keep going, startups. So, okay, it's the time to announce the name of the team. So can you please announce the winner of the 10 million won prize for the best dream award? 
。Okay, it's the time to drop the table. <laughs> We meet. Congratulations, Wendy, the senior Hansa Kansa. Please come up on the stage. And ambassador, you have to taste the chicken because he was preparing the chicken for us. <laughs> you can see the you can see the gloves, the blue clean gloves, right? <laughs> can you see the camera, please? <laughs> Okay, just for the trophy for now, but you're gonna get the prize after. Congratulations! Okay, we can all smell the food, right? <laughs> Time's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's important to show the Singaporean curry every day. <laughs> In Korean way, kimchi, cheese, and go our way. Okay, thank you so much. Please congratulate and please give your warm hand for both of gentlemen. Thank you so much and please visit it. Thank you so much. And CEO Hyunseo Kansan is going back to prepare the chicken for us. <laughs> so you'll have to taste it after all of our D-Day. So let's move on to the next award. Okay, not yet, not yet, not drumming yet. <laughs> okay, we have now IMDA Best New Entrance Award. As a presenter, we are gonna have um, IDMA Justin Ong, Assistant CEO, as the Best New Entrance Award presenter. Please give him a warm hands on the stage. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so. Of course, this team is gonna get 10 million won as a prize as well, like previous one. So, what the girls support from IMDA is? Kai Health. Wow, you have such a great voice. <laughs> Congratulations, Kai Health. CEO of Kai Hills Hedron Lee is taking a picture with Justin Ong, Assistant CEO of IMDA. Congratulations. Oh my god, music is so romantic. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, can you grab the mic for me, please? I didn't know I'm gonna close the event with this kind of romantic music <laughs> with the super tasty smell from over there. So yeah, how was the first overseas D-Day in Singapore? How was it? Was it a great time for you? <laughs> okay, I know who said yes over there. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate to spend your time, valuable time with our amazing five startups through the YouTube and on-site together in person. So, Deep Camp plans to expand our program worldwide, uh, starting from Singapore especially, and then Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the United States. We hope to meet many amazing Korean startups and also amazing international entrepreneurs who want to get into the Korea market as well. So I want you guys all to be our partners and helpers and supporters all together as an entrepreneur and as an investor and as a partner. So yeah, please keep an eye on DCAP and the five amazing startups that presented their business model on the stage. So thank you everyone to be with us, including YouTube viewers for supporting and spending your valuable time with us. So now is the time to have more conversation with attendees in here and having a chicken, unfortunately, without beer. <laughs> yeah, so from now on, we're gonna have a networking time for 30 minutes. So please enjoy your time with the catering over there. Thank you so much. I was Naya Jan. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys in next month of June D-Day.
Dickham with Popping Bridge. <laughs>